Hi, everyone. I'm Debbie Schwartz, uh, founder of Verge College, Pink for College 101 Group, and College Insights. So um, thanks for coming in the middle of the day, lunch hour. Um, just going to spotlight this. So um, hopefully I will try, we will really get this done in an hour because um, um, by doing webinars in the middle of the day, I try and be a lot more um, efficient because I know that uh, um, people, it's time is limited. But, um, and today we're going to talk about college lists uh, and, and particularly merit scholarships. But let me put, get my chat going. I'd love to hear um, people who are joining today. Um, if you have a, a rising college senior, maybe you might have, um, you know, rising uh, junior and kind of where you are in the process. Have you started building a college list? Have you used College Insights? Have you used another um, college search website? Um, just love to hear um, uh, kind of where you are in the process and a little bit about your student if they're, you know, a junior or, or a rising senior. And of course, I'm assuming um, it, you guys can hear and see me. So if there's any problems with that, um, put that in the chat as well. Okay, oh, here we go. I have two students, um, rising senior, rising junior, very behind in the process. Okay, that's okay, Stacy. This is, if you're right here now, um, this is good. You, you can get, get on track. Okay, great. Patricia said, Pat says it's a great tool. I've used um, the Fisk Guide too, which is also good. Okay, Rising Scene, we've gone to build a list. We have some established criteria, including availability of merit, but want to learn more. Okay, okay, perfect. All you guys are here um, with the perfect knowledge and um, intent. And to tell you the truth, we actually kept this session smaller than normal. Sometimes I've done this and we have like honestly, like 150 or more people, but um, we just thought going forward, maybe we would um, just, uh, we only sent uh, an invite out to a smaller group just to keep these sessions smaller. So, um, and hopefully we can answer a lot of questions. Great. Uh, so Lynn says, been using College Insights um, and other college websites, been on tours and more this summer. Okay. Good. I feel I feel good that we, you, you guys are here at the right time, um, kind of with the right knowledge. So I'm going to share my screen and get started. Um, okay. Oops. Where are we? Where's my screen? Sorry. Hold on one second. Uh, hold on one second. It's not finding what I want it to find. Okay, sorry guys. I have to open my PowerPoint up someplace else because it's not working correctly. Okay, I'm gonna do it here. Okay, can somebody give me thumbs up or just say in chat that you can um, see the presentation? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, sorry, I, I don't know, I have to figure out what's going on. I, I'm not showing it in its best format, um, but have, can you guys see it okay? Because I know um, I'm not doing it in the slide view because somehow I, I can't get Zoom to find it. Okay, yes, you can see it. So um, today we're gonna to talk about building a college list. Um, I'm gonna go through these first few slides a little bit quickly, but this is kind of basic, but I still like to talk about it. There's really, to, in my mind, there's three buckets that people um, can pull from to um, pay for college. And I kind of skipped from building a college list to paying for college because quite honestly, building the right college list is kind of the, is the key for figuring out how you're going to pay for college. PowerPoint is edit mode. You need to go to slide mode with impact. I know. Oh, 
uh, within PowerPoint, not Zoom. Actually, I'm not. Oh, okay. I, I, I hear you, Linda. I'm gonna. I'll try and do that next time. I think I'm. I'm looking at a PowerPoint, and I. Uh, um, and I'm doing it through Google Chrome, and somehow Zoom isn't isn't um, finding it. That's why I'm having troubles. I'll try it one more time. Let me try. Slideshow. Can you see this better? Thumbs up, somebody. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so um, when you talk about paying for college, there's really three buckets. There is um, money that's coming from your family that you've saved, right? Or if you can cash flow it, um, there's free money and there's borrowed money. And we're focusing on the free money piece of it uh, because we want to avoid having you guys go to the as uh, the borrowed money bucket, unless you're going to go government loans because um, they're they're not so bad. But the more free money that we can help you find, then the less you have to rely on borrowed money. And free money really comes from the bulk of it is going to come from financial aid if. If a big if you're in the position of having um, financial need, which I'm going to guess, honestly, most people on this um, webinar today are not in that position, or you're going to want to find money from merit scholarships, which is really why the bulk of the people are usually here. Um, and that's how we can help you the best. I list private scholarships. Um, it's definitely a source of free money. I kind of put that on it's at the very, very end of the process, you, you know, it's a lot of effort. I am not gonna say that people can't be successful finding private scholarships, but um, you have to honestly, in my opinion, put in a lot more work. Your student has to put in a lot more work um, to get the same amount of money in private scholarships as you would in merit scholarships. And the other big thing, the difference between private scholarship and merit scholarships, the private scholarships in a lot of cases are not renewable. The third issue is that a lot of colleges have um, issues with um, scholarship displacement. So um, you could get a private scholarship and it could displace money that the college offers you. So. Again, not saying it's something to ignore, but I kind of personally put it um, at the bottom of the list. You know, I like to do the 80-20 rule where um, where you can put in most of your effort and get back, you know, the biggest return. And that's really um, in finding merit scholarships. Okay, so if you're going to build a college list, you want to be um, do it as strategically as possible. Again, if you look at the whole process of college admissions, um, of course, if you know your student and um, and you as a parent um, knew as much as you did back in ninth grade, you know you would know that honestly ninth, tenth, eleventh grade are really important from an acad. It's a, those years are important to build up your student academically, socially, and um, extracurricular wise and hobbies and passions. But once you get to this point in the process, your most important step is to create a balanced and strategic college list. I like to say, oh, I, I didn't even realize I have it on the slide, but the, the, the bottom comment here, student, you can't get money from a college you didn't apply to, right? So if if you didn't, you, you wanna do the research and you wanna have the schools on your list that you feel you have the best chance of your student getting in, getting um, admitted and receiving money from. I mean, that's, that's the win-win. Um, and so building the college list is going to help you do that. If you build a poor college list, I'm gonna quote from a story of a, of a family later on, you're just not gonna have the options um, of where your student wants to go and actually more importantly, where you can afford to send them. Okay, so um, I would hope that most people know what Merit Aid is, but I'm just gonna give a quick um, you know, run through of it. Merit Aid is also called, you know. Um, merit scholarships. A lot of people are now calling it, you know, a tuition discount. Those are all fair, equal names. Um, and in the case of you're going to view it as a tuition discount, um, colleges are basically reducing their um, cost of attendance uh, for certain students, not all students. And they're saying, um, we want to attract uh, students with a certain type of criteria. It could be, you know, and a lot of times it's based on grades and SAT scores, but it could be based on talent, you know, um, um, or other um, um, criteria that they're using to round out their class. Um, but they're basically saying, we know your family doesn't have a financial need, but we want to discount the um, cost of attendance to you because we want to make it more attractive that you want to um, attend our school. Um, 
as I mentioned before, merit scholarships are usually renewable. So that means whatever is offered uh, as an incoming freshman is money that your student will receive for four years, as long as they usually meet um, a minimum GPA requirement. I always bring that up because um, most, most merit scholarship GPA requirements are fair, and meaning they're probably around 3.0. Sometimes there are some merit scholarships that are three five, um, and um, you just want to know whatever the requirement is. You want to know what what that um, GPA number is, and feel confident that your student feels confident that they can then meet those requirements. Because the worst situation would be in that um, you student you and your student choose um, a college. Um, you you feel you can afford it, but you're basing your affordability on the fact that they're getting merit scholarships. And then somewhere in the sophomore or junior year, they potentially um, lose the merit scholarship and, and that school is no longer affordable. So, so um, you know, you, you don't need to necessarily know those minimum requirement, GPA requirements right now, but before your student commits to a school and next spring in that time frame where you're comparing merit scholarships, it's definitely important to, um, to know that that I call it, you know, fine detail, but it's an important fine detail and um, and and know that before you make a commitment. Um, and then the last thing, if we're talking about affordability and merit scholarships, it is great that it is renewable every year. The downside, and we're seeing it now with inflation and uh, tuition increases, is that um, tuition is going to increase, but the merit scholarship dollar amount that they offer in um, going into freshman year isn't going to increase. So um, I just I bring that up because one of the things that we emphasize a lot, maybe not so much in this talk, but in other talks, is that you really should create a four-year plan for how you're going to um, pay for college. A lot of people focus on that first year. Um, you know, they focus on what, what the cost is for a freshman year and then how they're gonna pay for it, but they don't necessarily think about, um, you know, all four years before they make the commitment. So um, I just, you know, wanna mention that if you're gonna do a four year, uh, you know, um, um, forecasts, which again, I encourage everybody to do that factor in that the merit is factor in some um, increase for tuition and even now slightly higher than you would have before because of inflation, but um, know that the tuition, so sorry, that the merit scholarship money is going to be flat for all four years. Um, so uh, I see, I'm gonna look back and forth. I see there's a question here. How do grades and test scores impact results of a net price calculator? That's a great question. And um, the answer is that some net price calculators um, ask for that information. And if the net price calculator is asking for grades and test scores, then there's a likelihood that, they, that the um, results that they are giving you back have factored in some merit scholarships, but we're not even 100% sure in, um, if that's always the case. And if a net price calculator does not ask for grades and test scores, then they're not factoring in any merit. So um, net price calculators, I really encourage people to do, but you can't take the results as gospel. You have to take them as guidance. The, um, um, they're, they're directional. Um, so the government required colleges to have net price calculators on their websites, um, but they don't require any um, accuracy of the net price calculators, crazy as that might be as I say that. Uh, so um, do the net price calculator. I would do multiple net price calculators, you know, across all the schools. Um, if you don't, if they don't ask for grades and test scores, then they're, then they're not factoring in merit. So um, you're going to have to look at the information, which I'm going to show you later about merit and see A, A if that school offers merit and B, um, what the likelihood is of your student receiving merit and then uh, factor that into what the net price calculator result might have been. And in all cases, I highly recommend um, that you go back to the school and, and Christopher, I don't know, whatever school that you might have been doing the net price calculator for, if they didn't ask for grades and test scores, I would, um, and your student or you can call up admissions and say, does your net, net price calculator, you know, factor in any sort of merit? And if not, how can I get a better idea of what the criteria is um, for your school in offering merit? Okay. Um, so, 
uh, I always like to make give people a little bit of background on um, admissions and merit scholarships and really um, want people to think of the admissions office and the admissions officers, you know, kind of in terms of, of business. I think, honestly, when I started in this space, um, it, you know, I thought back to my time in college and I always viewed colleges as the, you know, Ivy Towers and, and um, they weren't really business people. They were academics, right? Running an academic institution and, and um, they didn't kind of run on the same rules as business does. But the reality is that they do. And so um, admissions officers are, Kind of the equivalent, and I'm not saying this is a bad way because I love marketing, but they're the equivalent of the marketing department um, or or the acquisitions, you know, team. They need to acquire students um, at a certain price, uh, and they need to deliver a certain amount of revenue. And they're also dealing with um, a fixed um, resource because they have uh, a campus that has a certain number of dorms, and so in some cases. Um, the dorms limit how many people they can bring on. In other cases, they um, run short of, of who they uh, enroll and they're, and they're trying to, and they have um, open slots because they have open beds. So um, it's, it's really the whole space um, of admissions has really moved more to a term called enrollment management. And, um, you know, the colleges are figuring out um, how to allocate their resources and their resources are their money and it could be need-based money and merit scholarship money. And they're trying to figure out how do I use that money to pull in a certain amount of revenue and meet the enrollment goals um, that you know, most likely the, the board of trustees has set and, and the college needs to just operate. And I just bring out, you know, this is a little bit just of, um, of information, but these are two big uh, companies in the space, um, Ruff, Ruff, Ruffalo, Noel Levitt, and EAB, and they work with many, many, many colleges on creating, if you've heard these days, the colleges run a lot of data, and they are running algorithms and modeling, and they're trying to figure out if I offer, you know, this particular student this amount of money, what's their high likelihood of, of accepting? And um, I found this on actually one of those um, companies' websites, and I thought it was just an interesting um, view, for, again, for you guys to understand how the admissions office is working. And, and, and I'll read this quote. Um, and, and this was the consultants, the two companies that I just showed you, this was their marketing material to the colleges. And they were saying to the colleges, you also need to um, you also need awarding strategies that address need and willingness to pay. Doing this successfully means that you have to understand the price sensitivity of the various student populations you hope to recruit. So the, the student populations are you and your students, right? And they, and they are, meaning the colleges, working with consultants are trying to figure out your price sensitivity and your willingness to pay. Um, and they are factoring that in among a whole other host of criteria, as you can see here, the first um, column. So they're factoring in your students' backgrounds, you know, their, their academic ability, that's the SATs, ACTs, and TED GPA, their motivation, that might be um, demonstrated interest, like how motivated are they to come to the school. It could also be motivation as shown through extracurricular activities. Um, so they're looking at all of these criteria um, or characteristics about your student, then they're also looking at, look at the second column, environmental factors. So they're looking at the competition. What are other schools that um, are in, or that are similar to their school? And, we, and we'll talk about peer institutions. How are they operating? What are their um, costs of attendance? What are they offering students? So it's just like business. Um, what are, um, what are some of the demographic trends? You know, um, so are there fewer or um, students applying from from the Northeast? Where is the bulk of the student population these days? Colleges are always on top of that. And then, and then the the um, third column here is what are there? And the and the third column are, are variables that you have no control over. I mean, you kind of have no control over the second um, column too. But um, and these are. Uh, more of the um, institutional priorities. So, you know, um, what are the goals that the colleges are trying to meet? What are the, you know, are they looking for a certain type of diversity? Are they trying to pull in certain types of students by location, by social economic um, uh, backgrounds, by interest? And, and those are, you know, um, uh, strategic initiatives 
that the college is set that you'll never, A, sometimes you don't even know what they are. Um, and that's just the way this process works. Some schools are more transparent about it, but I would say the majority of schools are not. Um, and then the second is, uh, I like to make this known because um, this is, again, you might not have control over it. So you'll hear a lot of stories, um, in, and they're true, and you know, you'll, you'll hear them in the spring time frame where two very similar students apply to um, the same schools, and it's just, you know, or, or actually you might see where one student, one, a student is a better academically than another school student, but that student who we thought was lesser academically got into schools that, that the other school student did get didn't. And a lot of that just comes down to the college's um, priorities. Uh, and, and, and that's the stuff we don't know. And so um, uh, there's just, there's unknown in the process, and there's things that are known. And what I'm trying to do today, and we're, we're always trying to do is help you control and manage what you can, what the knowns are, and then to some extent, just make you aware what the unknowns are. But, um, you know, we're not going to be able to control for them, but when a decision comes through that you just can't explain, it's sometimes because of the all the unknown variables that we um, won't ever really get the answers to. So um, when we talk about merit, uh, we have three buckets that we usually um, teach people about. So there is automatic merit aid, there's competitive merit aid, and talent. And I'm just going to quickly go through them. So automatic means that um, every application that that college receives, they are considering it uh, to give merit scholarship money to that student. So it's, and, and you'll see these schools, and I'll show you an example. They are usually more transparent. They show you a grid on their website. Um, they'll, they'll show you a chart and they'll say, you know, if your student has this SAT or GPA, sorry, or GPA, we're awarding these amounts of dollars. Um, and, and, and I think it's great that those, um, a really helpful uh, information. You don't have to go searching for it. Um, and um, you really, your student, all you need to do is to make sure you know about that information beforehand and know that you want to target those types of schools. But once your student sends in the application, they don't necessarily need to do anything else to be um, considered for merit at those types of schools. So competitive merit aid is where schools are offering a merit scholarship, but they are usually asking for an additional application. And it's really important to understand um, if this, the college is asking for that additional information, it's usually, it could be addi additional scholar, uh, uh, sorry, it could be an additional essay, could be an additional application, and there's usually um, a deadline associated with it. And in some schools, the deadline could be earlier than the regular admissions deadline. And so it's so important to do this research now. Somebody mentioned earlier that they hadn't gotten started. That's okay. June, you still have enough time to get started. My heart like the races when people contact me in September and October, still trying to do their college list because we can still help and you can still put a college list together, but you've just lost opportunity because you probably passed deadlines if you're waiting to September or October. So, um, um, so as you're putting together your student's college list, please look at all the deadlines. And if it's not clear, this is a great you know, task for your student to call up the admissions office. And a lot of schools' websites are not clear. I mean, that's just unfortunately the fact. And so um, if you can't find the information and you're not sure, maybe you're not sure if it's there, um, have your student email their admissions rep and ask, are there, uh, do you guys have merit scholarships that need additional um, applications or essays for, and are there deadlines? Um, so just to make sure you've covered, you know, all your, your bases. And the last is for talent merit aid. And that's for, you know, students who um, are in the arts, music, dance. This is not for sports, um, but these talent-based merit aid, usually there is um, an, an, uh, an additional portfolio that needs to be submitted. There are, might be additional essays related to um, the portfolio. And there can sometimes be, um, um, actual audition dates that need to be scheduled. So again, deadlines are really important. So let me just show you an example here of automatic merit aid. This is um, University of um, or Miami University. And I just showed, um, I happened to, uh, we kept the information from 2020, 2021, and now we updated to 2022. And I just, just showing you just to see that every year, and this 
this this particular change in the um, graphs obviously was impacted by COVID. But even if COVID haven't hap hadn't happened, you will see that schools change their grid every year because, and that's going back to the um, consultants I talked, I showed you about the um, EAB and Ruffalo Noel Levitz. They are constantly running numbers and they are constantly looking at how enrollment did one year and saying, huh, you know, um, we offered a certain amount of money for students with these GPAs and it worked. So um, let's tweak this a little bit and let's maybe reduce the GPA or sorry, increase the GPA that we're looking for and, and reduce the amount of money that we're willing to offer. So um, every year these grids change. As you can see, obviously 2020, it was right before the pandemic and um, they were still including SAT, ACT, uh, scores and a GPA. Um, and you, you move to 2021, which is the first uh, on the top left, and you can see that they um, were just showing GPAs because um, they had moved to test optional. And then you can see the reason why I wanted to compare 2021 to 2022 is you can see that they changed their GPA ranges. So again, they were tweaking and they, uh, they kind of bumped up um, the GPA range that they were willing to offer money to. Um, and um, the other thing I wanted to point out in this particular chart is that uh, Miami University was pretty clear and they were saying they looked at the weighted high school GPA. I should have, but I don't have what the um, footnote, number one footnote is. My guess is it, it probably explains how they're calculating weighted high school GPA. Um, well, A, for Miami University, I think it's great that they made it clear that they're, use, that they're using weighted. A lot of schools don't, they just say GPA. And in most cases, G colleges are using the unweighted GPA um, because they are recalculating the GPA and in the admissions office so that they make sure that they're doing an apples to apples comparison. But in any case, you know, I'm going to go back to like all the little things that are important to find out that actually add up to the big thing. And so I mentioned the little, one little thing was um, the um, GPA requirement, but that's a little later on. Another little thing, but it's important is, are they using a weighted or unweighted GPA and how are they doing the calculation? Again, I wish I had like a central source. Colleges don't share this information all the time. And, and, and um, we'd have, we'd be going back to them every year to see if their policies have changed. But this is a great question for your student to ask the admissions rep. Again, how do they, um, how do they calculate the GPA? Are they doing weighted or unweighted? And what, how are they actually doing the calculation? And I bring this up because I had a situation where um, there was a student who was calculating their GPA one way <coughs> and the college calculated it another way. They thought they were going to end up in the top tier of an automatic merit scholarship. They ended up in the second tier. They were just surprised and it obviously affected all of their forecasts of what it was going to cost them. Uh, it turns out that they were kind of on the edge. They appealed and the, the college um, granted then the top level, but that's just something you don't wanna um, have to run into as a surprise. You can um, bypass it by you know, getting more of the information up front. So Amory's asking, is there a site that shows, that lists the schools that offer automatic merit aid? <laughs> there isn't, there's not a source that I know of. Um, um, so what you can do is uh, when I show you College Insights, um, you can find the schools where your student is most likely to get merit. And then you can kind of go backwards and look at those schools and see if they have automatic um, and uh, merit information on their sites. We don't yet um, have that information where we identify whether it's automatic or not, because again, it changes year to year. Okay, so uh, I, I, I highlighted this. Please watch your deadlines. Um, I. Uh, wanted to just, I think I gave this example here on the left is Uni U University of Southern California. It's a pretty well known um, example if, um, if you're in the admission space that USC's regular um, decision, actually they don't have actually, they don't have any early admission. So their regular decision deadline is January 1st, but a big but, if you're a student who wants to receive 
competitive merit scholarship from USC and you have to send in a, um, a separate application, your deadline for sending in that application is December 1st. So if you're a student and you didn't realize that and your student wanted to apply to USC and you just thought, well, I, you know, when I send in the application, it will be considered for merit, you would completely lose out. And it wouldn't matter whether or not you, your student had the criteria to receive the competitive merit um, a, they wouldn't be considered. So that's a really important example where the deadline made, um, and it was a month earlier deadline, would make a huge difference on whether your student could receive merit scholarship from that school. Um, the second example is BU. And again, it's just showing that they had, um, they have a separate application. Um, so you have to know that. They are just um, on their website giving you a little heads up um, as to they're still test optional um, as a school, but uh, they tend to look at uh, students with certain SATs and ACT scores as having, you know, more likely to receive their merit scholarship money. So um, I have to say it's a little bit of a black box about this idea of schools being test optional and whether or not um, they are test optional for merit uh, and, or and offering their merit scholarship money. Um, a lot of lot of students who attest optional received merit scholarship money. So um, we know that that's ne not necessarily, you know, if you apply test optional, it doesn't mean you're going to get merit. We don't know the answer to um, did students who applied test optional and students who have applied with tests receive the same amount of money. I don't know. And in some schools, they do require um, um, test scores for uh, merit scholarship money. So I am sharing all this information because, again, this is more questions that you and your students should ask the, the um, um, admissions office. Um, you, you can ask them if you go to a, um, um, you know, a, um, a session, whether on campus or virtual, uh, but, but ask uh, if um, there are different requirements for merit. Um, and even though the school might be test optional, just confirm, um, do you need to supply test scores for merit or is merit test optional as well? Okay, let me skip this for one second. So this is an, a true story. It was from this past March um, of a family in our Paying for College 101 group. And I just wanna share it to show the importance of the um, having a good college list because if it's not, the, college, the purpose of the college list is that um, your student and you have options, right? So that uh, you have options come next March or April when, when um, admission decisions come in and you're not left with either, in this case, like one school that your student got into and you're not sure it's affordable um, or maybe they got into a school and they really didn't wanna go to that school and maybe that school shouldn't have been on the college list. But let me, I'll just quickly read this story. My son only got into two schools. He applied to six total, four of them were reaches, which is another, um issue that we need to overcome you can't put you know you should have reaches on your college list but the reaches should be balanced with reality so four of them were reaches he got waitlisted at four of these private schools of the two schools he got accepted to only one is a real option because it's affordable now he's saying he thinks that he picked the wrong school and that he should have cast a wider net which um, I'm gonna encourage you all to cast a wide net. And he's very remorseful of the decision. He wants to go to a second choice school that he got accepted to. The problem is the school is an $82,000 price tag and we did not qualify for any aid. So this is just an example um, that the family created a college list and it might not, it doesn't sound like it was actually a realistic and a balanced college list. It had a lot of reaches. It didn't have um, a lot of schools where the student wanted to go to. And they he and he or she could get in, or it was he, and that they could afford. So it's fine to have reaches on the college list as long as you balance them with reality schools. With the, and those are the schools that you know your student has a very good chance of getting in. You know you can afford it, and you know that if that was the only school that they got into, they would be happy to attend. So um, as I'm just kind of reiterating, you know, more simply what I just um, described that um, I want you to understand what's in your control and what's not in your control. And at this point in the process, what's in your control is that college list. So um, 
you get to decide with your student what schools your student is going to put on that list. Your student's going to fill out the application. It's a little bit like of a ping pong. At this point in the process, you have the control because you and your student have the control because about deciding where they're, they're going to apply. They send in their application. The ping pong goes back to the college. They have a little bit of the control then because they're going to decide who they're going to admit. The ping pong calls back to you. And then when you get the when you and your student get the um, decisions about where they've been admitted, now you get to decide where they're going to enroll. So it's a little bit of a back and forth, but right now you're in the driver's seat because you're building that college list. And your goal in the college list is you want to have options. So um, make sure for you know all the reach schools that you might put on the list, that there are enough um, schools that you feel confident that your student's going to get into, you can afford, um, and um, that they're going to be happy to go to. Um, be open-minded. Um, I, I, hopefully you're hearing this from a lot of other places. I hate the word dream school. Um, what, what value, you know, it's a lot of um, admissions consulting companies are advertising these days. We can help your student get into the dream school. We can help your student get into the dream school. What value uh, is um, uh, having a dream school if um, you can't afford it? So you have to balance you know, that reach with, um, can I afford sending my student to the school? Um, and then the last important point is make sure you have safety schools. And we don't love using that word safety, but the, where the, your student has a really good likelihood of getting into and they're willing to attend and you can afford. Okay, here are my um, search tips and then we're gonna skip over to college insights. So, um, how many of you have run, I, 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 earlier, Christopher, you run, run some of your NPCs, so hopefully um, you know your EFC, but how many have actually run um, a calculator, and, and a good one is on the college board, how many of you have run your, um, a calculator and you know your EFC? And, you, and nobody, you don't have to share with me what your EFC is, but I just want to see that you know your EFC. And it's okay to even say, what, if you don't know what EFC stands for which stands for expected family contribution. And so the EFC is the number that ultimately you get from when you fill out the FAFSA. Um, so the FAFSA takes all of your information, your assets, your income, and it calculates the number called the EFC. And, um, and although you know, the FAFSA doesn't happen until October, you can now, create an estimate of what your EFC is. And my opinion, the best place to do that estimate is on the College Board. Um, I would just Google College Board EFC calculator and they have a very good, um, close to accurate um, um, calculator of, will, that will tell you what your EFC is. So if you haven't done it yet, um, please, calculate your EFC. It's really the first step in building the college list. I know a lot of times we want to just jump to um, searching colleges and, and your student or you have a list in your head of what colleges that you are interested in. That's okay, but it's really important. It, it's honestly, it's like, it's, it's going to be a piece um, of your financial um, input, right? Like, I mean, you might, I'm just going to make the analogy to homes Right, it might be fun to drive a neighborhood, look at homes. You don't know how much they cost. You don't know, you know, what your budget is, but you're just, you know, doing it for fun. That's okay. But if you're really going out to buy a home, you're going to need to know um, your budget, and you're going to need to know what you're going to be pre-approved by the by the bank. This is kind of in that category. So you, the reason why you need to know your EFC is it's going to determine um, for a school and for you. You're going to know if you know your EFC and then you know the school's cost of attendance, you will know whether or not um, you will, are, you're gonna fall into the merit scholarship side of receiving money from that school, or you're gonna fall into the need-based side of, of receiving money from that school. And even if you have um, an EFC that is high, and let me just tell you that probably 98% of families feel like their EFC is too high and they cannot afford their EFC, and I sympathize and I wish I could do something about that. That's actually at the government level that we would need to do something about. But um, if your EFC is 30,000 and a school's cost of attendance is 50,000, right? Then your EFC is less than the school's cost of attendance. And technically you have what they call a financial need. That's the difference between the two. So your need is 20,000. And if that school is offering need-based aid, you actually 
have the potential of getting need-based aid money from that school in addition to merit money. So that's why it's important to know your EFC. Your EFC is going to tell you school by school whether or not you potentially fall on the need-based side or if you fall on the merit side of getting money. Okay, so important to know your ERC, please um, go out and do it. Second is um, know your family budget. And that is different than your EFC, right? So I just gave you the example of um, your EFC is, is 30,000, but that doesn't mean you can afford it. Um, and so there was a great story and I have to find the link and share it um, that a woman shared in the Paying for College 101 group. And she basically admitted that they, um, had a high income. So her EFC came out to, I think, 80,000. You know, and of course, the income, EFC is based on your income as of one year. So, you know, that family might have done well one year, but she didn't have the savings that she had built up. But in any case, her EFC was 80,000. But she said it, that she had decided that her budget was going to be 25,000. And you know what? She found a school and her student finally found a school that met her budget because. That's what she was going for. What the EFC told her was that she wasn't going to receive need-based school, need-based money from any school. So if she wanted to reduce her costs, she needed to find the schools that were going to give her student merit scholarship money. So that was the importance of her knowing her EFC. And then her budget told her um, uh, you know, what type of schools she needed to search for. And so, so now she was looking for a school where her net cost was going to be 25000 And net meaning... There was the cost of attendance, but she knew now her daughter was going to be receiving merit scholarship money. So she needed to find a school that that the cost of attendance minus the merit money was going to put her into that twenty five thousand dollar merit uh, budget category. And she did. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy, but but that's the approach you need to take. So that's, that's my number three. That's why you need to know, are you looking for need-based or merit scholarships? That's going to go back to knowing your EFC. So um, I believe in a, um, that a good start to the college search, and even if you've already started, and even if you've already created a list, um, is go back and start with a wide net, okay? You want to um, be open-minded and see what schools are out there just based on your student's GPA and test score that are gonna give your student, in this case, I'm gonna focus on merit scholarships, that are gonna give your students merit scholarships. And, and if you just, if you start with the GPA and the test score, you're not starting with location, you're not starting with the names of the schools, you're, keep, you're being open-minded because you might find a school on that list that you didn't realize, well, A, you, you might not know the name of it, that's okay, um, you didn't realize um, that they could give your student merit scholarships. And then you can start doing the deeper dive into the research um, on what that school is all about. But if you um, automatically jump to, I'm only looking for schools you know, in Massachusetts, um, I'm only looking for schools that you know, offer um, um, you know, certain, a certain major, which your student might end up switching from. Um, I'm only looking for schools that are the big rah-rah schools, you know, that have 10,000 or more undergraduates. You've cut out a lot of schools that you didn't know that could possibly be um, good for your student and be more affordable. So that's why, and I'm going to show you, I suggest just starting your search with the GPA and test score, and then um, looking at which one of those schools can offer your student merit scholarship funds. When you're building a college list, I always recommend um, include your state school. It is um, most cases going to be one of the more affordable options that your um, student has, because if you can get, you know, as the state school, you're going to get in-state tuition. So always have that on the list. Um, it, it's a little bit like of a backup. Um, number six is include a leverage school, or what you can also call a peer institution school. So a peer institution school is, is that it comes back to business. It's a school that one college might view as honestly as a competitor, you know, because they're very similar. They're very similar in the types of students they attract. Maybe they might be similar in the price. They might be similar in the style of their teaching. And so um, if you have um, one of these leverage schools on your students list and it comes time for next uh, March where 
hopefully they've gotten into the leverage school and they've gotten into the other school that maybe your student really wants to go into go to you could depending on what that leverage school offers you could potentially use it for negotiation purposes so i wouldn't go wild on this but i would pick the school that your student is most interested in getting into or and and where they ha have the ability to potentially get merit scholarship money and i would find a similar school that you can put on the list um, that where they have a good likelihood of getting in and maybe they might get more merit scholarship at this leverage school and you could use it as um, negotiations for later next spring. Okay, um, let me just, I'm gonna send you all of these um, tips, but I'm gonna jump over now to College Insights to show you how that works. Let me see any questions. Um, are EFC from College Bowl and NPC on college sites similar numbers? That's a really good question. So somebody's asking, is the EFC from the College Board and the net price calculator on college sites similar numbers? They may not be. Because again, the EFC is what the government is ultimately going to calculate, and that's based on the information from the FAFSA. Um, and um, a net price calculator is going to be the net cost that the college is estimating for you. They are. They might be using information that the government uses when they calculate your EFC, but those numbers may not end up to be the same. Um, okay, somebody is also asking, is this the same type of thing like a job offer where you may be forced to choose a merit offer but before he has before he has all the offers on the table? You know what? Potentially, you could be off. You could be your student could be forced to um, make a decision before they have all the offers on the table. Things are really shifting in college admissions these days. Um, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but there was a, um, um, a, a, not a ruling, but there was a change in, in the guidelines of how colleges operate um, about two years ago. And it took away, or it actually gave the colleges the ability to um, have more flexibility in um, asking students when they need to commit. Um, so there is something called the National College Decision Day, which is May 1st, but it's all, there's no, there's no enforcement of it. A college doesn't need to, you know, um, a college could ask a student to, to admit earlier if, if they're giving them money. So um, unfortunately that is a possibility. And, and I think we haven't seen that much pressure um, in that, the past two years, but my guess is we might see more pressure from colleges in the coming year, asking, like basically giving what they call exploding offers. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. So somebody just, I, I didn't, how do you find um, leverage schools? So um, there's two ways, and there might be more, but uh, two quick ways that I do it. Um, one is I honestly Googled the name of the school um, plus the word peer institution. So if you did like Tulane peer institution, what happens is some of these schools actually list on their own website who they view as their peer institution. So that's one way. A second way is a little bit more complicated. It's going through iPads um, by looking at schools that, that the government views as similar to that schools. And I'd have to, um, I, I can show you that on a separate time or send you directions because it's a little bit more complicated. But the first is I would just try and Google the name of the school and peer institution. Okay, so let me jump to College Insights. Um, I think I, let's see, you guys there, I can't find my Zoom screen. This happened to me once before. Okay, here, got it. Okay, um, just somebody do me a thumbs up or say I see it in the chat so I know that I, you can see. Okay, good. Thanks. So, um, so let me quickly go through College Insights and um, show you how you can use some of the data in here to, to, to go through the steps that I just um, talked through. So if you haven't used College Insights before, I'm just showing you, this is the main screen. Um, you would just go to get started. I'm not gonna go through it. And basically it asks you to tell, you know, are you a parent, student, or are you somebody else? What year is your student graduating college? Sorry, high school. And then it asks you for five schools. 
Um, and these are the schools to help you start your first list and then it will move you into College Insights. This is a free account. To, for you to see the five schools is free. Um, and it's to, so you can see all the data that's available and you can see the different search criteria. If you want unlimited access to all of the information and all of the schools that we have, you, um, you need to start a um, paid account, but the first seven days of the paid account are free. So you get a trial, for seven days, you can see if it's worthwhile. If, if you're gonna, if you want to use it, if you know, if I um, encourage you, if you um, can get all your searching done in seven days, that's fine too. Um, but um, you need to uh, go to the seven-day free trial and the upgrade, and then you will see all the data that I'm going to log in and show you. Okay, and if anybody wants to like uh, go along with me here, I'll just put this in. The chat as well. Okay. So when you first go in, it will actually show you your five schools. I think I, I, I must have put in these five schools. Um, but if you, and then there will be a button up here that will say go pro. And if you go pro and uh, you get the um, unlimited access, you'll be able to see all the schools. And the way you can do it is um, go to search for specific school and then click all schools and search and it's gonna show you um, everything that's in the database. Okay, um, so I'll quickly show you there's three different ways you can um, search, actually two ways you can search for schools. Um, the, the first one, the first here is as you're searching for schools, if you wanna create lists, you can name lists and then you can go back and pull up your um, lists later. Um, oh, uh, here, so I might, you can create, um, and you can make any names you want. So here's, this is a list of favorites. Um, I might have created, here, uh, top 30 schools with most generous merit scholarships. So as I was doing research, I would then create a smaller list and give it a name of um, you know, what all those schools had in common. Um, and then you can go back uh, later on and just search you know, the, the, the smaller lists. So that's one way to search by lists. The second way is if you do have specific names of schools that you know your student is most interested in, you can put in the the school name, Oops. Um, you know, I'll just say like Tulane. And then you can build a list by just putting in specific schools. And then you can also save those schools to a list as well. But this down here, search by preferences, is really kind of um, uh, where I want people to start going back to that um, step or that I'm encouraging you to do to be open-minded, okay? And even though we give things like major and location and school size, again, if your um, need is to look for schools with merit scholarships, I would highly encourage you that you um, start with just the SAT slash G ACT and GP or and or GPA. And I know that um, students, you know, might want to apply test optional, but if your student has a test score, let's start with it. And if they don't have a test score, what I would recommend is. Um, to convert your student's GPA to a test score. Uh, and you can do that by, um, there's a few, there's two tables out there. And um, I would honestly just Google um, ACT to GPA conversion to find, the, to find the tables. And the reason why I'm telling you this is, you know, um, we only, our data, we're only as good as our data, right? And the data comes from the colleges. And the colleges haven't been as good about collecting or at least sharing detailed GPA information um, with people, you know, outside the institutions. So um, ACTs and SATs, they share a lot of information. They share what percentiles, you know, um, they, they um, admit students in um, and, um, and it's a, a very good clean breakdown. For GPAs, they only really tell us what the um, average is. And in some cases, I'm gonna show you, for whatever reason, 
a lot of schools don't actually even share their GPA information. So if a, if a school is going to share information, they're in the past been more likely to share the test score and less likely to share the GPA. I don't have an answer to that. I don't know why. Um, maybe in these coming years that will change as test optional has become more important and they're relying on GPA a lot more. Um, but that's just the, the data fact. And so um, we have more data with colleges and test scores than um, GPAs. So I would um, encourage you to convert um, your students' GPA to a range of a test score and search with that. Uh, and, and we can still search with GPA. It's just that um, not all the schools share as detailed GPA information. Okay. Um, so let's go. I'm just going to pick an ACT. Um, and let's say this student had, um, I'm going to take an ACT range of 28 to 30. And that's it. That's all I'm going to put in. And I'm going to say, show me the schools where that test score of 28 to 30 is in is at or above the 75th percentile. And the reason why I'm saying that is I want to find the schools where that test score is at the top of the school's range because that's where schools are most likely to give the most merit scholarship money. Okay, so I, I didn't check. Let me just make sure. Yep, it starts, it's kind of come back. So these are all the schools, um, and there's three or more pages of schools that um, that test score is in the top range. I'm going to jump to um, merit the, the tab on the top that says merit scholarships, and in this little grouping, um, there's um, some a few good columns. But the column I like to sort on is the one that says the average merit award for the freshman without need. Right, so we already know that these are schools where the 28 to 30 ACT is in the top percentile, and now we're going to see who gives the most money in the in these scores schools. So, um, so the so Beloit came, came, rose to the top, and Beloit gives on average forty thousand dollars to freshmen who have no need. So they're giving out forty thousand dollars of merit scholarship money. Again, this is to the student who has a G, an, S, an ACT score of 28 to 30, because that, that puts them at the top of the range for um, Beloit, and Beloit's giving $40,000. Um, and what's really interesting is the column to the left that says freshman without need receiving merit. 97% of the students who applied to, to Beloit, who had that, that range of 28 to 30, um, Oh, I'm sorry, 97% uh, of the students who applied to Beloit who, who didn't have a financial need, Beloit was giving them merit scholarship money. So you know that if you're a student with that has uh, merit, that needs merit, and you apply to Beloit, and you are above their average and even better, you're in, the, in their 75th percentile or above, you have a pretty good chance of being offered merit scholarship money, okay? And to even kind of confirm that, the column that says merit scholarship, cat oh, sorry, we're gonna to go to compare offers. We're gonna actually look at um, people who shared their real offers that they got from Beloit. Okay, so this is from this past year, 16 people shared um, information with us and they told us um, whether their student applied early action, early decision, and probably, and then regular decision. Um, and we have it grouped by EFC range. So honestly, if you're a family that needs merit, you're probably at the top, if, at the above 60,000 um, EFC. So the, these students received less than 40,000, but pretty good dollar amounts. They received 34,000 to 36,000. So um, I don't know why they didn't receive the 40,000 average. It could have been that they applied early action and Beloit might've been saving that money um, for later in the, in the process. Um, but they did come somewhat close. You know, it could have also been that um, we, we don't have actually, oh, here, here's, here's a student um, that had a 33 ACT um, and they got 36,000. So they got on the higher end. Um, so, um, so we, again, we didn't see a student that got 40,000, but the, we got, we saw students that got, you know, good amounts. And so if, um, 
this student received $36,000 and the cost of attendance for Beloit, and I'm just, you know, making it up, I'm not going to look at it exactly, might be 70,000, and I'm sure it's in that range. So the net cost um, to this family was $34,000. So um, this goes back to my example of the family of the of the parent that said I have a budget of 25,000. Okay, in this case, the 34,000 would be the above the $25,000 budget, but it's still a pretty good price, you know, relative to what the cost of attendance was, but it's because you found the school where your student was at the top of the range and that school gave a good amount of money. So that's kind of how you were able to narrow it down to get to a school that potentially might cost in the low 30s. So it is one o'clock now. Um, I, you know, don't want to hold people. I know it's the middle of the day. Um, I'll answer some questions, but I, I hopefully you got a good enough sense to get started. You know what to look for. You know what merit scholarship is. You should go out and do your EFC. Depending on if your ESC is below or above the cost of attendance, you're either going to be looking for schools that can offer your student need-based aid or merit. My guess is majority of you are going to need to look for merit. And if you're looking for merit, you can use College Insights to plug in their um, uh, test scores um, or GPA. You can't do both at the same time right now. But um, and um, and then sort the columns and find find the schools where your student can get the merit and um, and and then you should, and I'm not saying now just go off and apply to these schools. Now at least you've started wide and you've gotten to the next level where you've narrowed it. Now it's worth your time to dig in. Um, go to, you know, go to a virtual session with them, visit if you want, go to the college website, really dig in and understand the majors and, and the classes and the dorms, but, but you're now doing it on a set of schools that you know have a good likelihood that your student's going to get in and that they'll receive merit scholarship money from. Okay, let me see some of the questions. Um, what GPA is used in the search? In um, Unless it's it's noted, which there's a handful of schools that told us that they um, share weighted GPA, the GPA numbers in College Insights is based on unweighted. Um, so you can't right now search by SAT and GPA. What I do um, with College Insights is I search obviously one or the other. I'll search usually by the test score, and then I will sort by the um, GPA. So in this case, we, we searched by the ACT test score, and now I can um, sort the column based on the, the GPA and then go down and see where my student's GPA is matches the average, because this is the average, or where um, my student's GPA might be above the average. So you can just see here, if a student, if a college has told us, or they've actually told um, um, the common data set that they use weighted, then we have a W next to it. But most of the schools um, do, are using unweighted. And I just wanted to go down and show you. Oh, and all of the ones where we um, don't have information, like Marquette University, you would think that they would give us, and not just us, it's not just me, it's, it's, it's sharing to the public um, GPA information, but they didn't. So that's why it's important to look at this both from um, a test score perspective and a GPA perspective. <laughs> okay, for a student who is not sure about the major, would using academic scoring for search be a good start? Um, Kathy, I'm not sure what you mean by academic scoring or if you mean by like, the, like their test score GPA. Honestly, if a student does not have to be sure of their major. I know there's this big push, uh, you know, that some schools say, well, well what are you majoring in? And, and um, you might even have to choose the school, like am I choosing the school of arts and science or am I choosing engineering? And um, if you're a student isn't sure, that is perfectly okay. And um, I just wouldn't search for schools based on major then. I would just search, you know, based on where their academics put them at the top. And then I would do, when I do my, next level research with those schools. If my student was undecided, I would make sure I truly understood when the college was going to require them to make a decision about major and how flexible the college is if my student chooses a major and wants to change. Um, so some schools are very 
you know, um, open and letting students move around within their major. Other schools, surprisingly, are not. So, um, and that is really important information to know, again, as part of the research process, because it might, it might impact whether your student wants to apply there. Okay, could the money be added to the NPC? Is that how to think about it? So Christopher, I think what you're saying is um, if you ran an NPC that did not ask for any stats, so it didn't ask for GPA and it didn't ask for, um, for a test score, um, if you looked at College Insights and found that that school offered merit money, as an estimate, you could take the average merit money and subtract it from the net, from the result of your net price calculator. You could. I would also call the um, admissions office and at, just to confirm um, that they're not including any um, merit in the net, net price calculator. Um, but you could, but you could do what I just said, and I would use it as a you know an estimate. None of this is is um, you know. Um, to the T, it's all directional information. So does the merit scholarship section include competitive merit aid? Um, yes, Kathy, in, in College Insights, whether the aid, whether the merit scholarship was automatic, whether it was, it was talent or whether it was competitive, it is all lumped in. Um, so it's here, we don't necessarily identify specifically which is com um, competitive merit, which schools are giving competitive merit scholarship and which schools are giving automatic. Rumor is it that early action merit amount would not be higher than regular decision. Is that true? Kathy, it's a great question. Uh, uh, I don't wanna say it's a rumor. I think it's really, it's it, it can go either way. I have seen schools where they do give less money. Um, usually it's less money um, early decision because they're holding out their money to the regular decision round to decide you know, um, who they might need to give more money to, to, to attract. I've also seen it the opposite where a school gives more money early action because if they feel that if the student's applying early action, they obviously want to go there. And if, this, if the college can offer a good enough deal early on, maybe the student will just say yes and kind of finish the process and, and not go further. So I've seen it both ways. It's hard to tell. In my example, you searched an ACT range 28 to 30. Would that return schools where higher ACT scores is in the top 70? Just yes. So, um, so I um, searched um, the, the test score of 28 to 30, and I wanted to see any school where the 28 to 30 was going to be um, um, in the 75th percentile or above. Um, oh, I'm sorry, but it wouldn't show, but it, 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 if, if there was a higher ACT score, so like um, if, um, the, if the school's 75th percentile started at a 32, that would not show up in, uh, in the test scores. It would, so, um, so it, it's not showing higher um, ACT scores that are falling in, that schools with higher ACT scores that are falling into um, um, a 75th percentile or above. If my student has a strong GPA and SAT score, is the ACT required needed for merit? Oh, I don't know if you're asking, Rick. Um, I'm reading two questions in here. Um, I, Usually ACT and SAT are interchangeable. Every school, if they're gonna you know, look at a test score, they don't care whether it's an ACT or an SAT. So don't feel like your student has to have um, one versus the other. They are both um, equally valid. Um, if my student has a strong GPA and an SAT score is, uh, so again, you just need a GPA and a test score. It could be, it just needs to be ACT or SAT. It does not need to be both. Um, oh, you know, um, does College Insights database include art schools? It, um, it, it does. Uh, it, so the College Insights school includes um, all schools that uh, have 500 students or more, 500 undergraduate students or more, um, and that get federal funding. So um, if, the, if it's an art school that gets um, federal um, money, uh, then, um, uh, and it has 500 more students, and then it should be in our database. Okay, so somebody's asking, what does the dash mean in the average merit aid for freshmen without need? It means that the college did not provide that information. 
How many schools should we narrow our list down to? That's a really good question. So I guess I have a few different answers to that. Um, if you're starting with a wide net, I would look at, I would hope that you kind of do a search and get a minimum of 40 schools, right? Um, that's, that's a wide net or even larger. I would, and then, you know, through a little bit of, of high level process of elimination, you know, maybe at that point it's, um, you wanna look at location um, to narrow it down. I would get to a list of 30 and then do deeper dives and deeper dives, I mean, and we actually have a whole session based on, on how you research a college, but a deeper dive would be um, looking at the school's websites, um, understanding if your student is gonna major at that school, what the criteria is or what the courses are like. Start um, looking at other sites that might have student reviews about the colleges. Maybe you schedule um, a visit then. So I would go from like, you know, 40 or 50 down to 30 to do your really good research on. And then ultimately, obviously get your 30 to 10 to 15. Um, and those are the schools that your students gonna have to start writing um, essays for and doing applications. Uh, so somebody's asking, do you suggest any adjustment to the test scores because students are only submitting scores if they are at or above the median? Should we look back at older common data sets to understand what the true average or 75th percentile might be? Um, it's a really good question, um, Pat. Um, to tell you the truth, right now, we are a month away from um, putting in the most um, latest data for College Insights. Um, and that's just because it takes a few months to gather all the data from all the college's common data sets, you know, um, uh, and then move it in here. So to your question, I don't mean to say this in a bad way, but the ACT, SAT information is a little on the older side and it would be the truer average um, than, than when we are gonna update it uh, so, um, um, in a month. So I would feel okay using the information here, but you can always, what you're suggesting, which is also a good idea, as you narrow down, go to the college's website and look at um, the common data set, maybe from uh, you know um, two years ago, uh, before some of the um, test optional um, impacts happened, which might have might be shifting up what the average um, uh, SAT or ACT scores are. Oh, oh, so Shahana, this is a great question. What's the most common way of calculating an un unweighted GPA? Every high school seems to have their own grading scale, even for unweighted. It's so true. Um, obviously, you know, it's the five core classes, um, um, you know, science, history, social studies, English, and a language. Um, and we are doing a session next week, which you'll get an invite to. Um, that's a free session on calculating the um, unweighted GPA. So uh, I'd rather not get into the details now, but um, we have uh, an article on our website about it and look for the session next week. I think it's next Wednesday or Thursday that we're doing just on, on calculating unweighted GPA. Okay, everybody. It's... Um, uh almost a quarter after there's 55 of you that hung on thank you thank you thank you give college insights a try um i'll say one last quick thing is um we are also starting something um in addition to college insights we call it a college insights academy which we are bundling some of our past recordings because we had a service where we um, do live sessions with families to guide them through the through the admissions process and we're bundling college insights with these past recordings that you can look at and we're calling it college insights academy plus so anybody who um uh joins college insights we're going to be upgrading you in about a week um, to College Insights Academy Plus, where you can get all this other content. So that's just an FYI if you want to um, give it a try. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, for the endorsement. Um, and if you guys try it and have any questions or issues, just please um, email me at debbie at rhodescollege.com. You can email support at um, support at rhodescollege.com. And uh, we um, try our hardest. We usually can get back to you definitely, you know, within two days, hopefully within, within a day. Okay, I was gonna say good night because I'm always using doing this at night, but have a good day, have a great weekend.